Thank you so much for coming to our event. This is Bostino State of Innovation event. Uh, my name is Lucy Maffei. This event tonight is about our corporate innovation labs. We are about to hear a lot about our amazing panelists. I'm just going to uh, tell you a little bit about American Inno, the company that Bostino is part of. So American Inno, our mission is to be the voice of local innovation. We are in uh, uh, 12 different markets right now, and uh, we want to be the voice of local innovation by organizing events like this one and by working on our editorial product. Uh, the main one is called The Beat. It's a, a daily newsletter, Monday to Friday. It's a really short uh, two-minute conversation between the writers about the local tech scene and what's happening in the local tech scene at that time. So if you have time, I can tell you it's really good. Just subscribe if you don't like it. No problem, you can unsubs unsubscribe every time. No, st no strings attached. Uh, thank you again for coming tonight. Uh, thank you to all our panelists, moderator, our, all our guests, uh, and uh, uh, to our amazing showcase uh, that's downstairs. So please uh, just take a look. And uh, um, this night uh, could have not been possible without our amazing presenting sponsors, which is uh, um, Analog Devices and Analog Garage. So please give Analog a round of applause. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn the mic a second to Ashish Shaw, who is going to uh, talk a little bit about analog, and uh, then we're going to get started. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Analog Garage. Uh, some of you may be wondering kind of what we do here, given the lack of uh, grease and oil <coughs> that you see around us, right? Nice view. Um, analog Devices uh, is a $6 billion international a semiconductor company, and we're headquartered here in Massachusetts with R&D centers uh, around the greater Boston area. Um, but this particular site um, is different. So the Analog Garage uh, is chartered to foster entrepreneurship for ADI internally and externally. Within ADI, anyone among our 15,000 strong employee base can pitch an idea for disruptive technology or business model into the analog garage, and we decide whether we fund them or not. If they get funding, they can move out of their current roles <clears throat> and work on the idea for the length of time it takes to prove it out. So we tap into 15,000 budding entrepreneurs around the world, whether they be in Beijing, in Bangalore, in Limerick, here in the Boston area, or in the West Coast. The second thing we do is to work with startups and research universities around the world. Startups get access to ADI technology to help them accelerate their progress or receive investment, and in some cases, are acquired. The last thing we do here is to build a critical mass of expertise that are non-traditional. For us, being a semiconductor company, non-traditional is non double -E. We have biochemists, chemists, mathematicians that are part of the analog garage. We have people in backgrounds on signal processing and machine learning and in cloud software. In essence, we're building a critical mass of people who are going to help us achieve growth over the next 10 years and more. And that's what the Analog Garage is. It's wonderful having a space here in Boston so that we can host events like this. This is the third event we've worked on with Bostino and hosted here at Analog Garage. Now, let me pass things over to Robert to get the panel discussion started. Thank you. Thank you. Got a microphone on, and it sounds like it's working, so we'll, we'll go with that. So good evening, everyone. Fantastic to have you with us. Uh, thank you for bringing us together and supporting, a, I hope, what you consider to be a very worthwhile conversation. Um, the world of work, the world of R&D is rapidly changing. I'm sure all of you are paying attention to that. We're going to dive into some of the implications of what that means, what kinds of platforms are emerging around us, uh, big companies, small, all integrating in new and nimble ways. We're going to unpack quite a bit of that tonight with some fantastic examples. Uh, for a large chunk of my career, I was overseeing something similar in a way at Johnson & Johnson, overseeing in the healthcare sector a series of investment teams and incubators and some of that. And we may touch on a little bit of that, but most importantly, we're going to learn about some really, I think, equally, if not more interesting examples outside of healthcare that our panelists represent. And while I give them just a quick head start, 
because I'm going to ask him a surprise question. Uh, I'm going to poll the audience just for a moment. So each of you, in one word in just a moment, are going to tell me a little bit about yourself. So, and I'll give you a tip. So I'm a scientist, as an example. So we're going to limit it to you know, what we do at work, not what we do at home. I'd have to say I'm a father if I was to qualify my real obligations. But think about that. And we're going to learn more about you first so that we have a sense of who we're talking with. And we really do hope this evening is a conversation together with you, not at you. So we'll have some time at the very end where we really will you know, make it a formal opportunity for you to say something and we'll get microphones out there. But all along the way, you know, if there's something that you would like to share, please do raise your hand and I'll run out like Phil Donahue and get a mic to you and we'll get your, your voice into what we're, we're doing. And so how many of you are from the corporate world, work in a giant company? One, two, 10, 20, there we go, reasonable number. How many of you are in a startup? Okay, how many of you have ever been in a startup? Okay, large fraction. How many of you are actually associated with some form of an accelerator program? Okay, reasonable number. We'll talk about some of the data associated with that. How about just an incubator? Okay. All right. And how about just using co-working space as a way to you know, fill the day in a more interesting way? Okay. So that's a good representation of just how, interestingly, the world of work is already changing. Away from big campuses where the big companies that made all the money parked everybody away, they all had two or three cars, you know, to worth of parking for all of them to places that are far more metro, right, that are in the heart of cities because the workforce expects a different way. And uh, I think, frankly, that's what R&D is going to require. The types of financial models that are emerging are far more focused on efficiency, and there's enough capital in the markets, at least as the world we live in today, to drive a whole new agenda without it necessarily having to be a giant company that you turn to and the profits that they're making to be able to get your idea sort of on its, on its way. So I'm turning back to you. As I was a scientist, you are? Uh, I'd, I'd say I'm a matchmaker is my primary function. Okay. So matching uh, customer problems with potential new solutions. OK, fantastic. And you? Uh, roboticist. <laughs> hey, Molly. Oh, with the mic. Yeah. I'll say connector. Connector, OK. I'll say catalyzer. OK. <laughs> and I'll say lowly engineer. <laughs> Well, we've got a bookend here, you know, us, you know, I'm called pale, male, and stale. I'm not sure what we are, but, you know, we're, we're here in more conventional terms. But I think just by hearing what you've just heard, doesn't that say in and of itself something about the way leaders who are doing these kind of things have to see them? So now we're going to be you know, a little bit more realistic or we'll call it practical about ourselves. And, and if you would, in just a few words, talk about your organization and we'll just start maybe on the other end, Pat, with you and we'll come back this way. Okay, thank you. So I'm Pat O'Doherty. Uh, uh, for want of a better word, I, I am responsible for the analog garage, and Ashish did such a wonderful job explaining what we do. So the only thing I would like to add to that is, when you look at our surroundings here, please don't be uh, too distracted by them. For the several years before we moved here a year ago, we were in the Cambridge Innovation Center, and we were sitting on top of each other's laps with equipment falling on our heads. And we looked exactly like a startup, and we just outgrew the space, and we were, we were getting in the way of external startups and taking up too much space there. So we came here, and then this happened. <laughs> so. It's a really nice garage. There's no question about it. The best view of any garage ever. Gary, how about you? you okay, I'm Carrie Allen. Um, I, run so I have several hats. Um, I work for CIC, Cambridge Innovation Center, which builds innovation communities, and I run CIC's Captains of Innovation program. Um, which is a corporate innovation program, full spectrum program. And working with one of my clients uh, several years ago, um, Sampo Japan, a large insurance company in Japan, I realized a need for age tech innovation. Um, and so I recently launched and co-founded Agency, which I'm representing tonight, which is um, a cluster within CIC focused on age tech innovation. So. Perfect. Thank you. Well, that's cool. I want to learn more about that. <laughs> we will. Hi everyone, Emily Reichert. I'm the CEO of Greentown Labs, and we are the largest clean technology incubator in the United States. We're based in Somerville, so a stone's throw away uh, because we're all in Boston and we're all so wonderfully close together here. Uh, our mission is to provide the community resources, space connections that startups in the clean tech space need to grow and thrive. Uh, currently, we host about 90 companies within our 100,000 square foot campus. 
uh, three buildings. And what we really specialize in is, is supporting these clean tech startups who often are building physical products. So it's really all about hardware. And that means we have laboratories, we have a machine shop, an electronics shop, a rooftop testing lab, even a wet chemistry lab, because those are the type of innovations that are typically associated with clean technology. These companies need to manufacture things, so we help them, support them to do that. And so my role, I'd say, is almost master connector of startups with everything that they need in order to grow. Thank you. So I always love going after Emily because my response is just what she said except for robotics. Um, so we, we uh, Master Robotics is an independent nonprofit. We run a shared workspace in the Seaport District where we support uh, about 30 companies doing pretty much just hardware-based robotics type of applications. Um, we provide support and all sorts of facilities to help them grow. Um, the, the one slight difference is we really focus on companies that are going to transition to product. And so rather than being truly like an incubator or an accelerator, we take companies maybe out of Mass Challenge or some of these other locations and try to help them grow from a proof of concept to something that can be on the market. And so that's where we think we can add the most value. Um, we also have a workshop that is full of robots. So if you ever want to come down and see everything from a humanoid to uh, uh, the latest industrial automation, uh, let us know. Great. So um, I'm Brian Elisney. I work at Thomson Reuters Labs here in Boston. We're one of five labs globally for Thomson Reuters. Um, I also help incubate the lab in, in Dallas. And what we do is we take all of this amazing data that Thomson Reuters has and try to develop new solutions for our customers in legal tech, reg tech, and tax tech. Um, so we uh, co-create with customers both internally and externally as well as collaborate with academics here in uh, in Boston and beyond and uh, we have a, a startup fund for uh, um, um, for a venture fund for startups as well as uh, uh, an incubator that's both physical in Zurich Switzerland focus on blockchain but a virtual incubator that's uh, worldwide okay perfect well that gives us a bit of a post-it note for all of these on the what they are. What I really want to spend most of our time on this evening, and again, encouraging the bravest of you to work with your arms, to get you in the conversation too, so we can ask questions that matter the most to you, is you know, more on the why. Why are they doing what they're doing? And importantly, on the how. Right? All of you have the jobs that you have because of some trend that has taken you from what you were doing and putting you into these leadership roles to do the work that you're doing now. So I'd ask you to reflect on that as your organizations or the organizations you've had in the past, what is it that you feel like is uniquely um, uh, required of your organization now? So maybe we can start with you in the middle, Emily. Why Greentown? What's the major driver that you see sort of uh, brings it all together? So the major, major driver for us is community. And we bring together community on many different levels. So one is a community of startups who are supporting one another through a lot of different peer support mechanisms. Um, it can be anything from uh, helping one another to learn how to pitch an investor to helping one another learn how to use a certain type of software. They share everything, interns, um, test rigs, you name it. And so what we really try to do and what we've tried to do from our founding days is support and grow that community because if you're going through the challenge of building a hardware startup it is one of the hardest things you can do um, there's not that much money out there there are a lot of technical hurdles so you really need a community to help support you and that community takes place both within the walls of our incubator but also as we bring in others who are supporters from the ecosystem and even really around the world folks that care about the same issues that our startups are passionate namely addressing our climate cli excuse me climate crisis mm -hmm. so there are many many people that are kind of fighting and hoping for our startups to succeed and that's a great feeling for them and it's a great feeling for Greentown well, that's fascinating to hear. As we get into the, you know, some of the, the toolkit stuff, it, you know, a little bit later in the things I have in mind to talk about, how we enable that, right? How do we get people to really work together who really aren't in the exact same organization, share a resource, share incentive, share culture, 
you know, but at the same time get their work done too, right? How do you make that happen? How does space facilitate that? How does other sort of leadership example help facilitate that kind of thing? Um, maybe we can hop around and Pat and have you tell us what, what has brought, you know, the garage into being as an example. Sure. Um, yeah, I think this is a, a, an interesting story. Uh, so we sit here in the center of Boston and uh, we're part of ADI. It's a $6 billion corporation. We spend about a billion two in R&D every year. And so one would think that a, a company that spends that much money uh, would be able to take care of its own innovation and uh, develop the sort of technology that, that, that we need. But you know, we look outside at the universities and we look at the incubators that are out there and the amount of innovation is out there is just staggering. And the barriers to entry are disappearing. And so for companies like ADI or any technology company to sit back on your laurels and say, oh, we have a market position and we have established expertise and we've got loads of creative young engineers who are doing all this cool stuff and that's enough. You know, that's the death knell for a company. It may, may take several years for, you know, the knell to occur, but, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, that, that's the beginning of the end. So this site exists to look at the next five to 10 to 15 years? And what technologies, capabilities, abilities are we looking to get to in order, in order to be able to grow and develop and try and figure out what we want to be beyond the scope of most of our business units? Because most of our business units take a kind of a five-year time horizon. And you know that's true of most technical companies. Uh, and really what we're trying to do here is to look out beyond that and not only just in time but also look at capabilities that are not adjacent because our, our company is very good at adding adjacent capabilities but we're not we haven't historically been so good at reaching out and seeing something that is beyond the clear vision and maybe a startup that can't answer all the questions that we might have of them but has something really unique and really compelling and so we're created to be able to reach out to them and to interact with them. So we're almost uh, uh, we're working on, on, on the impedance that exists between a large corporation, startup communities, and the research community, and really trying to, to develop win-win scenarios for, for both ourselves and those other entities. And, and so far, it's working really well. And, uh, and this isn't a a acquisition vacuum. So the, the, the analog garage isn't a, a disguised venture fund where really we're just looking to get involved with startups so that we can figure out which ones we want to acquire. We partner with startups, we collaborate with them. Some of them we do acquire, um, but it's, it's the full gamut. And really the, the, the key advantage of working with someone like ADI is the range of technology that becomes open to you as a startup, because as those of you who are working in startups, particularly if you're in the upper management of a startup, you know that the, the passion that drove you to start that entity uh, gets kind of replaced with chasing investors. And when you work with ADI, a lot of that funding pressure goes away because the technology is available and the barriers to adopting it are lower and the company can focus on building their business and we can help with developing the technology, whether it's miniaturizing something or increasing the capability of it or turning it into something that they didn't even know that they could, they could do. And so it's this one plus one is greater than two sort of a, a dynamic that goes on. Mm -hmm. Certainly defying gravity. The bigger you get, the more gravity I think you tend to feel you know, is a, an art form. And those in the academic world who've studied the, you know, in great detail I think prove very elegantly that it's only those organizations, and they coined this phrase, absorptive capacity, who have the capacity to find ways, whatever ways those are, through you know, different forms of interacting with the ecosystem, but are better than their peers at being able to bring in remarkable ideas, that those are the ones that survive, and the others you know, are the ones we read about. So it's an important thing, and I'm sure you're doing and doing well here as a good example of that type of thing. Now, Brian, uh, maybe we could. Uh, so, so we started out about five years ago uh, when we realized uh, two things. One, that you know we're a 150-year-old company and uh, slow to innovate. We grew primarily through ac acquisitions, and so uh, folks were sort of focused on their own 
product, but not necessarily thinking about uh, the synergies across these products that that shared sort of um, similar data and similar purposes. And then five years ago, um, we also uh, recognized that there was this whole uh, big data technology stack that this all of this data that we had acquired and we had uh, more or less by accident in our 2008 merger, we had sort of lined up how all of these pieces of data fit together in principle, but not in practice. Now with these big data technologies, we could actually integrate all this stuff and begin to just mix and match it more or less at will and, and do um, cool new things with it. So that's, that's what the labs were started to do to, to find these ways to leverage data across the company to do uh, things that people were maybe focused on just one tiny slice of it for their uh, legacy product. Mm -hmm. okay. Tom, how about robotics? Um, so we were really uh, formed, we're about four years old, and we were formed by a number of folks from within the industry, from within the robotics community. Uh, I think one of the things they noticed was that although some of the early robotics work was done here, a lot at MIT and, and some of the other universities, a number of the startups and some of the larger research labs were starting to move out to the West Coast. And there was a question of why. Why can't we retain some of this talent? And uh, there was that we really need to build a better ecosystem, one that's supportive. And so that's kind of how Mass Robotics was formed with the intent of providing the services that startups need to be able to survive. And, uh, and we've grown from there. Mm -hmm. So Carrie, you've had some of the coolest jobs ever, mm -hmm. right? So you've worked with some of the most creative people in our city, I think it's probably fair to say. Um, as you see what's happening now at CIC and bringing the co-working space to a whole new level, interacting with communities, what's driving the agenda there? Well, um, the agenda for agency, for CIC, it, it's global. It's to really help innovation. Uh, innovation fixes the world's problems. Um, uh, and for agency, to date, uh, every person on this planet's aging. So it impacts all of us um, and <laughs> every single one of us. And so um, we're, we need to, with science actually allowing us to live even longer, we need to rethink everything. And so with agency, we're trying to help encourage startups and entrepreneurs to think about this, but really catalyze a global conversation. And so while we launched um, in Kendall Square last November with a grant from Governor Baker's administration, because he did declare he wants Massachusetts to be the Silicon Valley for age tech innovation. So the timing was great. Um, we want to be in every CIC globally um, and really catalyze a global conversation that includes entrepreneurs and startups, but corporates, um, healthcare, caregivers, it, it impacts everything. So we have to rethink as we're living longer, everything we do, it impacts our food, our nutrition, our transportation, our clothing, our design, our chairs, this chair wouldn't work for, you know, a lot of older people. And so with that, our four pronged approach is co working, a sandbox for these startups to have a community. Um, but also, we're doing programming, lots of programming to shine love and light on our startups. So, tonight, even over at Agency, we have with the MIT Enterprise Forum um, a, a panel and are highlighting a lot of our startups too. Um, I saw and it, then, by the way, thank you yes, for joining us. Yes, I know well, Danielle, my co founders uh, over there. <laughs> Um, and and uh, then also ecosystem connections are hugely important. So connecting the startups um, to people, also connecting corporates um, to think about this with each other, with government, it's policy. There you know all sorts of people, players that are important to this. And then, of course, with our corporate consulting um, arm as well, we're trying to help brands think about um, new, new ways to get into this space. So. So it gives us a sense of the why, the kind of things that they believe are pushing their organizations towards where they're going. Obviously, it always takes someone believing in it to fund it. You know, you have to come up with ways in which you can prove that, in fact, it matters. You know, the KPIs of all this turn out to, you know, be a, a sort of a non-negotiable truth over time. If you're not delivering value, this thing won't last. There won't be a garage, you know, unless things come from the garage. There won't be agency unless there's fantastic solutions that help people clean tech, you know, I'm with you on the world needs this desperately, uh, you know, and I'll go along the whole list here. Uh, but now let's talk as practically as we can, you know, about the platforms that we have. You mentioned corporate venture as an example. You know, it's a bold move to, you know, for a big company to decide that we want to invest in the tiny, right? It's one thing to be helpful. I will assure you it's a very different thing to be a shareholder, right? You have all sorts of things, you know, now you have to take care of that you never had to take care of in the past uh, on financial reporting and other kinds of, uh, issues that are now your responsibility as a fiduciary inside of an entity. Um, sounds like you've got a lot of 
co-working and other kinds of hardware capabilities that are readily available. You know, they all come with all sorts of uh, interesting things that are challenges and liabilities and all sorts of stuff. But let's talk about you know, what you think are the most powerful pieces of your program to start with. What's really seeming to move the needle for the people who come into your orbit every day? And we'll start again back with you on the end there, Pat. What's, what's really are you seeing, you know, taking the, the game that you're playing to another level? Okay, so as Ashish mentioned at the beginning, about half of what we do is internal, so it's dealing with entrepreneurship, yes. which still has its own fiduciary responsibilities, yeah. of course. Um, but half of it is external with partnering and investing in startups. So um, what's been most interesting as we, as our venture team engages with startups is that as we explore the technology or the business model that's on offer, increasingly we find that the money that we might have to invest in that company is of less and less interest. It's actually the access to the technology, it's the ability to expand the product because it can start to take on some of the capabilities that we have uh, already in place. And that's an efficiency that is, uh, is incredible. But it was an eye opener for me that, uh, you know, and, and in retrospect, it's probably obvious and maybe it's obvious to many of you in the audience that, you know, if we're carefully selecting really good startups with very interesting technology, well, other people have seen that too. So that's what VC has created for. They can fund that. And while and when they come to join the garage, they have an obligation to sort of, you know, check with you first before they deal with somebody else or no obligation, no strings no. attached, you come up. With no, a relationship, it's not, no, it's, it's not no strings attached okay. because if we're if we're making an investment in okay. a, in no, a but company, prior to an investment, if they haven't gotten money from you, if they're is there a way for them to be here without having financial oh, relationships sure. yet? Okay, yeah, so yeah. There, so a, there may or may not be an okay. equity investment or yeah. arrangement there, but uh, I just want to say that we're not angels from on high that just sprinkle out uh, uh, <laughs> technology and and, and, and funding. Yeah. yeah. So if we're if we're putting a big investment in yeah. place. Sure. That we, point, we, you know, the we obviously is want to make yeah. sure that there's some end path where there might yeah, be a return sure. to be generated. Sure. But, but, um, but, it, but it was an eye opener for me to see how, you know, kind of marching into a discussion with a startup and, and you start exploring the technology and what we can do and how we can add, you know, it could be even a, a worldwide sales force, they're, they're, they're increasing the reach of, of, of the startup so that they can focus on technology development rather than trying to replicate a lot of capabilities that are already established on our side. Um, and so there's an efficiency there, which is kind of interesting. Like if you think about, you know, how globally we want our economies to find and they do find the most efficient path forward. This is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is that, you know, we've got brilliant innovators out there. And when they take the path of going solo, and of course that path is right for several of those companies because that, that they want independence and they want to grow into something large but many of them want to progress their technology and they want to get their business model up and running and they don't necessarily want to spend the next three years trying to hire a sales force and trying to develop field application support and and that's available and so if there's if there's a a good collaborative arrangement to be had they can focus on what they love and we can help with a, a lot of the peripheral stuff as well as furthering their technology. And that, that's kind of a, that's been a very cool experience over the last few years. Certainly what I experienced at J&J &J too was just the, you know, the non-financial contributions in many ways trumped you know, what we could ever do as a financial sponsor. Help, you know, money is needed always. Now you have to design your teams and not allow them to do that in a truly, I think, unencumbered way. Another point that you made that certainly comes out of the academic work that I mentioned earlier, those companies, aside from being really good at bringing things in from the outside and having their product offering really be embellished by work of people all over the world, those that are the best at sharing their stuff on the outside are those that are in a whole nother quadrant uh, as it relates to success. So the ability to get your stuff out to enable the success of others is really the, the key differentiator in being highly successful and sustainable over you know, long periods of time. Now, Kerry, if we could talk about you know, what you think is really turning out to be some of the most persuasive pieces of, of your platform. You know, I would say things like brand and other things that sometimes we take for granted. If you're a small entity, you know, having a, a, a group fighting for you, 
goes a long way. But what, what do you see Absolutely. in the early days of agency is really breaking out for them? Well, um, some surprising uh, things that I've seen is, you know, we, we had a ribbon cutting in November, and so it's relatively young, but we already have 15 startups working in our space, five more onboarding right now, and is the community and the connections. And so um, they're varied. Uh, there is a, a company um, that is doing imaging for early Alzheimer's detection. There's a French shoe company that's putting IoT in the shoes uh, for early fall detection. Yet... They have uh, formed sort of a collegial group where they're now meeting to discuss NIH grants because Cody won a grant and he's helping the others. Um, and now a Founders Over 55 club has been founded and we're going to officially launch it at Venture Cafe in June, right? And so some very interesting things. And then we've been able to bring in gerontologists to talk to them. And then Benchmark Senior Living is one of our sponsors. And so that's an innovation pathway where they're able to do focus groups and take things into the elderly care facilities to really test uh, test products. Products. And so it's really the community and the connections. Oh, got it. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing there may be something similar that you might share, Emily, but uh, what, what beyond that, you've already made that as a core component of what you see happening that's making these companies what they otherwise wouldn't be. Other things you feel like are, are truly, you know, taking them to levels or keeping them out of harm's way, obviously facilities and being a economically organized, all that turns out to be really important in running any kind of business. But the platform that you have, what's the, you know, the second most important part beyond the people that they're sitting next to? Yeah, well, I'd go back to the word I used at the beginning, which is connections. Okay. And uh, the reference that I'd like to share around that and the thing that I think we're very proud of and feel like we do uh, differently and in a very strong way to support startups is the work that we do between startups and corporate partners. As it just so happens that uh, most companies who are in the clean tech space, like I said, they're mostly building hardware, they're mostly going to be business to business type companies. So they're selling to a General Electric or they're selling to a Siemens or mm -hmm. there's someone down the road that they're gonna to need to sell to or work with to get their product out into the market at large scale that is gonna be a large corporate partner. And so we're blessed to work with about 45 of them right now and I have to give a shout out to the angel sitting over here, Pat, um, and also my friends back there from Aero uh, who are great partners in one of the things that we do specifically to facilitate these relationships is called our Greentown Launch Program. And that is a special accelerator within our incubator that's a six month program. And the whole purpose of that is to help startups and corporate partners come together into relationships in six months. So as you may know, uh, the time scales and the language and so many other things are different between how startups make decisions and how large corporations make decisions. A startup might be two to four people and a large corporation might be 160,000 people. How does the startup even find its way through to navigate who are the right people within the company that they actually need to talk to? And then once they get there, how would they make the sale? What levels of the corporation need to be involved in that? What intellectual property do they need to be worried about uh, you know, in terms of agreements? So the program that we run uh, really starts with a search for startups that the corporate partner is particularly interested in. So we've done programs uh, ranging from IoT and energy solutions to uh, the latest one is around plastics and materials. Uh, that are going to reduce the amount of plastics that end up in our oceans. Um, a whole range of different problem statements. Then we go out and find startups, both that are currently at Greentown Labs, but also we do searches around the world. The current program, one of them we're running right now, that we have applicants from 18 countries. And we bring them in. Um, well, first we down select from maybe 100 applications we get to about five companies that we put through the accelerator program, which is six months. And in that six months, we do very, very deep engagement with the large corporate partner and the startups in the sense that we make sure that there are touch points at many different levels in the company. So typically we'd involve business unit heads, the innovation group, the uh, corporate venture group. Often we have the C-level coming through to be part of the program. And what that does is it helps make the, the decision-making process in much more um, doable because you have multi-levels who are already knowing about the startup, who are already aware of the startup's technology, who have met the team, 
And so when it comes to make a decision about the relationship going forward into some kind of partnership, you can make that decision relatively quickly. Over the course of the six months, the startups learn about how to do a large corporate partnership, make a complex sale, negotiate around intellectual property, do a licensing if that's appropriate, um, do a, a pilot study that's effective. So there's a lot of training all around how does the startup work with the corporate. And then the, the other secret is that along the way, the corporate partner is usually learning how to work with the startups. And so by the end, you have everyone very well aligned to do a partnership. And we see about 70% of the companies that go through this uh, launch accelerator program do end up in partnerships, whether that's an investment, can be a pilot, it can be a first customer relationship, it can be a licensing. We've seen all of those outcomes and we've run four of these programs, we're running four more this year simultaneously. And so we're just really excited about this launch program and the outcomes that we've had and the startup partnerships that are now leading to these companies getting their technology out into the world faster. It's fascinating that you mentioned that. I just saw some data this week that uh, suggests um, I'm entirely sure I can believe the number, but anyway, I'll use the number and we'll call it questionable. 16% of all the successful, and I don't know exactly what the definition of successful was in this instance, U.S. companies last year had gone through an accelerator program. Right. Uh, seems like a big number to me, but uh, given how many companies get formed in the country every year, but nonetheless, 16, and that was over double uh, just five years ago. So there's accelerator programs, you know, as a way to get a lot of, you know, insight, capital, um, community, are certainly you know beginning to uh, emerge as a remarkable component of new company creation. I think it's probably in the tech industry that that was those numbers are focused on, but I don't know that for sure. Now, I'm gonna we're gonna keep going, but I'm gonna give you a you know an early warning. You know, I told my my sons that it wasn't good enough to sit in the front row. You had to also ask a question, you know, just to make yourself known. And if you ever found yourself in the back row, God help you, you have to ask a question. <laughs> and so anyway, I'm going to be coming, you know, back to you in a moment. But uh, to keep going on this, and then we're going to have a speed round at the very end before we truly do open it up to, to Q&A uh, explicitly that really talks about how, and you already touched on it a little bit, Emily, how, you know, how your community gets built. But we do want to provide a little more detail on exactly how do the people that you're working with every, every day get picked. But if you could keep going on your platform first. Please. Sure. So, um, again, tough to, to follow, Emily, because a lot of that community is the same. But I want to touch on a couple of things that I think we focus on that, that have made our, our program really successful. Um, one is because robotics can really impact virtually any industry. It's not an industry of itself. It's a, an enabling technology that, and we have everything from medical to self-driving cars to I. Uh, exoskeletons it, it just it's a huge range but they all have a common element of they're building hardware hardware is tough we already heard that and it takes a long time yeah. and one of the things about it taking a long time is as a startup you don't generally know as much about what else is going on in the world because you're heads down focused on your thing and there's nothing worse than spending two years developing a robotic platform and coming to find out that oh somebody's doing it just like that or they've used a new sensor that ADI has developed that they didn't know about. So for us, it's really important to, to work with some of the large corporates and understand their roadmap. And we've just signed up with ADI, thank you very much, um, to work with them on that so that we can expose some of our startups to the technology that they might not normally see yeah. when they're out on their own. And so that they kind of have a leg up. So we think that's an important part of it. Yeah, certainly. Fast moving world. I can only imagine how fast it's moving in the world you're talking about. I'm imagining, Brian, that you know there may be data in something you're going to say, but uh, we'll let you not uh, surprise me. <laughs> I'm going to say the word data for sure. It's probably several times. Um, yeah. So, so one of the things that uh, the ways that we can partner and, and nurture uh, new companies is by offering them data. Uh, there, I said it again. Um, uh, so, you know, so some of you out. Out there are uh, alumni of the fintech sandbox, for example. So fintechs are uh, often have the problem that you know they they want to develop new models with financial data, but they don't have the data. And so partnering with a company like ours now allows them to to grow and develop their models and 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 so on. So that's that's uh, definitely one of the the things that we can offer. But of course, these days there's also um, danger in that for a company like ours because with all the machine learning that's um, taking place. We don't want to provide data for uh, someone to develop a machine that would then disrupt our own businesses. So we have to be very careful about 
how we partner um, and, and keep controls uh, over what we do, but um, that's obviously one of the best ways for us to partner. Yeah, makes sense. Well, Emily, you have a mic, so we're just going to turn to you. Uh, mic in hand means you're, you're live. So uh, in beyond what you've said already, what else would one who's in the audience want to know about how to be in your facility? Sure, so I can talk a little bit about our application process. So Greentown Labs is looking for companies that are in the clean tech space, and we define that quite broadly to mean companies that are trying to use resources <clears throat> excuse me, more efficiently <clears throat> or um, reduce the amount of waste in the, that's going into the environment. And so we say basically if you're doing more with less, then you are doing clean tech. So that goes all the way from uh, energy storage and renewables, which most people when they think clean tech, well, obviously solar and wind, but then uh, we also have companies that are doing energy generation and energy uh, distribution, transmission. Then there's companies that are doing something with transportation, agriculture, waste, water, even a few robotics companies that are trying to make manufacturing processes more efficient. So clean tech is, is pretty broad, but I'd say what brings most of these companies together is a common passion to solve a really big global problem. So that's, that's kind of the commonality of all of our companies. So we look for that first. Uh, we are also, of course, looking for good teams. Uh, typically, we like to see a business head plus a uh, technical head. That's really kind of the, the best possible solution rather than having one technical founder. You don't always see it, but that's uh, the ideal. Uh, we want to see that they've typically gone through some kind of accelerator program. To your point, uh, we like to see that before they get to Greentown Labs because that's really a good opportunity for a company to of get the tires kicked on their business plan a bit, uh, you know, get some advisors, start building a team, and then ready themselves for a seed round of investment. Once they get that, then they're really, that's when they're ready to start at Greentown Labs in an incubator. And they'll typically stay with us for about two to three years while they're building their company to the point where it can be independent after a Series A round of investment. In terms of other factors that we look for, um, you know, it's just general seriousness. We like to see that founders have quit their day job and are ready to, to commit to this full time. And we always are looking for companies that are um, really at the point where they are uh, building that first prototype, which they now need to be able to uh, make enough of to test in a real environment, a real world environment. So typically they'll come to us with one prototype that they might have made in a university environment. And then during the course of the couple of years that they're with us, they get to the point where maybe they make 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 and test those in the real world environment. So that's what they're doing while they're with us. So we like to see that they're going to be able to um, kind of make that trajectory. I think we have two levels of um, application review. One is our team, kind of a cultural fit. Are you going to give back to the community as well as perhaps take from it in terms of advice and the things that you provide uh, participating in events and whatnot? Um, and then we have two investors and myself on our board of directors who review every application. So we're big, we don't take equity in our companies. We're really in it for the mission but we are trying to have a certain level of quality and also have a level of seriousness that builds a strong community because everyone is there for the right reason. They want to build their company. They want to have a big impact. They want to solve a big problem. And so when you have that commonality, it makes everything else possible. Yeah, sounds terrific. You know, certainly the success of these communities depends on selection, right? Because what you want is that cohort of alumni that have been extraordinary that others are thinking that they might be the next one of. A little better there? Okay. Um, the 16th agency company, Kiri, what might they need to be? Or, you know, not be, but, you know, what would right. be the, the features that would the be features. similar well, enough to the others? Um, certainly their age 
focused, yeah. age related focused. It could be in any industry, but uh, we do have an application process. If it's related to science, we want to make sure the science is good science. We we are trying to curate who's in the space. Um, once they have they've, to be in Boston. Um, actually, we have some people that want a seat in Boston, and so mm-hmm. we're in CIC um, uh, and its co working rates, and so they can have a seat and just be out of San Francisco and, and have a seat here. So we have, have uh, people interested in doing that as well. Um, but the mix is the startups and scale-ups, but we also, res- <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the mic, <laughs> reserve um, space for um, nascent ideas. And so, you know, this this whole idea grew out of an idea-thon I hosted with Sampo, and so we had prize winners, and so those were nascent ideas, and so we want some space for that, or scholarships if we have corporate partners that really want a certain... Um, company in the space. We um, allow them to provide scholarships for them to sit there. And then sort of based on my uh, my history, um, Robert mentioned my former job. I ran a Harvard professor's innovation lab for eight years and co-founded the Art Science Prize with him, an innovation education program. So I like uh, to have a multidisciplinary environment. And so we want to have experts in residence, but also artists in residence. And so we will have a composer in residence who's working on an opera around aging. Um, just cool to, job, right? to, I mean, to on, spark uh, yeah. more ideas because I think that really helps um, innovation. Uh, more broadly, so. Wonderful. Yeah. Thomas, what about mass robotics? Um, so one of the things, we, we have an application process as well. Um, we're very focused on certain technical aspects. So there's a commonality amongst all robotic platforms, and we want to make sure that they have some of those core elements because otherwise they can't contribute to the community. And we're back to that word community. Um, so f- as an example, we have uh, what's called a ROS working group, and ROS is robotic operating system. So it's a common operating system on platforms. Many of our companies use it. And it's just great to see them get together, chat, and go, oh, I have a problem with this. Oh, you have a problem with that. And they're doing very diverse products, but they have a common interest and something that they can contribute back to. Um, we tend to focus less on uh, the financial side of it a little bit. They have to pay rent? Um, they have to pay rent. Yes, they do. Um, we, do we, we get subsidized by our, our corporate uh, partners, so it's a minimal rent, but they do pay rent. Um, but we also think that there's so many great programs. We've teamed with CIC, and, and actually the chairman of CIC is the chairman of Mass Robotics. Um, but CIC offers so many great programs. So in terms of that, we, we tend to po- focus them. With them. You know, go, go to CIC. You've got a great uh, team there, Venture Cafe, all of the things that they do. So we really tend to focus on the technology because that's where we think we can add the most value. All right. All right. Uh, how about you, Pat? What's going to be the, you know, the criteria that people should know about here to be potentially in the garage? So I'm very jealous of, of you guys being able to focus on something, on clean tech <laughs> or robotics. <laughs> Because in ADI, we have a, an industrial business unit, we have a healthcare business unit, an automotive, a consumer, a communications, and so we're manically focused on everything. <laughs> and you can imagine the stress levels that that generates. You but can with the same and you can see what happened. Again, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but the common theme is anywhere where we're dealing with physical phenomena and trying to convert that into intelligence, basically, is where we're interested. And that might be a startup that has a new breakthrough biosensor material. It could be another startup that has a new capability for uh, nanoscale 3D printing. It could be uh, a startup that has a cloud-based algorithmic uh, machine health uh, business that we think is very interesting. And so anywhere where there's something that is differentiated unique, tends to be high performance, we are very interested. Uh, we're very interested in... Have to be uh, in Boston? Uh, no, 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 no it's all over the world. Okay, no. all over the world. Uh, yeah. And so we, we, our, our venture team is based in Boston and San Jose, okay. but we make use of all our R&D and sales facilities all over the world. So there's kind of, a, there's a wide reach. Uh, but, the, but the common theme is, you know, this breakthrough technology and something that we don't have because, I mean, if, you know, if someone comes to us and says, I've got this great new startup and we, we know how to develop the best data converters in the world, we'll probably be like, oh, we already spend so much money doing that and we probably have it covered. Uh, but what we don't have is, you know, this unique sensing technology that, uh, that uh, is able to detect something and that we're able to miniaturize and, and, you know, put into a different form factor. So, 
Okay. Uh, we're looking for new, different breakthrough and really across the, the board in terms of markets. And okay, industries. come back to you, Brian. So what do, let's get you a microphone. Um, what do they you know, generally need to look like to be the appropriate group for partnerships that you're interested in? Yeah, sure. So geographically, you can be anywhere in the world. We're working with a company in Amsterdam currently, um, so that doesn't matter. But uh, we do focus on, you know, uh, at the beginning of the year, we look at growth areas for the company and um, we look at certain themes that uh, we want to investigate more. So things like, uh, you know, this year, contract analytics is a big theme that we're pursuing. So if you fit that theme or that vertical, which we see as high growth, then uh, you'll have more of our attention. Um, but uh, you know, of course, we're always looking for good ideas um, for our customer base across mm -hmm. across the board. But Okay. Well, obviously, a big part of what today's about is allowing you to network with our panelists so you can ask them directly You know, something that might be relevant to how you learn more about a website or an announcement or something in particular that might be lining up or you think it might. But we've not talked about something. And what is it? Any of you in the front have a glaring question or anyone else? Here's one in the second row. Maybe I'll do the Phil Donahue, I promise. There we go. James. Hi, my name is Jim. I work for Schneider Electric. And uh, we don't have an innovation lab. And I'm jealous. Okay. So for anyone on the group that has sponsored one to initiate one or come up with the right presentation to present to a corporate innovation internal, it'd be great to hear from that. So the idea yeah. is uh, the best practices for firing up an innovation lab. Well, let's talk about that then. Let's talk about our, our origin stories, just as a way to frame it in a slightly different way. And I'll start just very briefly. It was the chief scientific officer of J&J &J who believed, you know, in ways that I think uh, had touched on that there was just no way that the, at the rate that we had to grow that we would ever be innovative enough to do the kind of scaled R&D that we would need to do. And we wound up as a derivative of that, um, you know, creating innovation centers that put very technical people out in the ecosystem. They had no other job than to work alongside innovators. Pumped up the corporate venture arms so that we could be a very robust investor when that day came. And then built um, incubators. You know, we wound up with 13 at this point and 400 companies come to work every day in one of those incubators. And about 25% of all the partnerships that J&J wound up doing came from that relationship structure, not because they had any obligations to us, but because through time, you know, they got to know those individuals and they wound up cho choosing J&J to be the partner that they wanted to move forward with. But my point of all of that is it really started at the highest level. He was the highest R&D individual in the entire organization overseeing all of J&J's R&D and it had to be at the board level and by the CFO and others who really made it possible for a sustainable period of time. I would you know, encourage you to think about five years worth of work to be able to have something that you can really defend on its ROI. Please. Yeah, so we, we actually uh, use a model from MIT, uh, the 6S model for, for innovation uh, groups. So when you start out, you should be separate, uh, supported, and um, now I'm going to forget one. <laughs> uh, Sounds Googleable. And then, yes, and then, uh, so as separate, supported, and, um, and shared. And then you need to, as you grow up, um, you need to be systematic in how you uh, in, intake projects. That's very important. You have to be very disciplined about what, about what projects you take on and what projects you don't. And it's very also very important to be seen. Uh, you need to constantly be in a, in a large company like ours, constantly be communicating what it is that the labs is doing, how people can interact with the labs, what kind of projects are, are um, appropriate for the labs to take on and so on, and um, to, in, in order to sort of maintain that, and that all takes a lot of discipline. Let's just go down the row and talk about what got us started. Um, so I'm going to give you a little different example. Um, just because as, a, as a, a small company ourselves, we don't really have a corporate side of it. But um, we work with one corporate partner, MITRE. So MITRE is a large defense contractor. They have about three or 4,000 employees up in, in Bedford. Um, they came to us about, hey, we want to have an office. And, and we were very hesitant because we wanted to understand what did they want to accomplish with that office. And if you're just going to bring down, we didn't know who they were going to bring down to that office. We didn't feel that they would contribute to the community. And they said, no, what we really want to do is bring down a couple of um, HRI, human robot uh, interface specialists. So people who try to understand how robots interact with humans. Um, and their purpose of coming to our facility is 
they work with the Air Force on, on a number of drone projects and others of, of where these soldiers have to control these devices. But they wanted to understand where is the industry going? How, what are the new control metaphors look like? And can we be ahead of the game so that when we go back to the Department of Defense, we're really smart on this and we can bring some of the latest technology. So they were bringing some of the current trends from the military to us and to some of our startups. And we were imparting to them where the startups are going on this particular narrow thing. And they brought researchers. And so that's been a great partnership. Um, it wasn't one of, you know, we're going to try to come in and just see what the startups are doing. Yeah. We really are contributing to the community. Yes. The thing that got it going, Emily, what, what was it that sort of made it happen? Uh, what happened for us was uh, a couple of startups graduating from MIT and not having a place to go. Okay. And so that was really the founding story of Greentown Labs was yeah. it was people that were trying to share cheap rent. Yeah. And it really turned into a strong community and that community attracted more and more yeah. folks. And uh, eventually it became an incubator. So it was very much an accidental organic growth uh, type of situation. Uh, just to address the question a little bit in the way that Tom did, which is how do corporates engage with um, an incubator and like how do you kind of access that or really make uh, the best of that type of partnership? What we've seen is that people come in and they actually immerse themselves in the community. So they have desks at Greentown Labs. They have um, lab space at Greentown Labs where they're doing kind of their own skunk works type projects. And so that type of, you know, being on site, being part of it, interacting with the entrepreneurs on a day-to-day -day basis, I think really makes a difference in terms of how in-depth that you can do a uh, partnership. And really, there, there's lots of benefits there. I mean, we've seen a lot of companies want to be in the space simply because they have employees that are kind of at the early end of their careers and they're excited to be part of a startup organization and come to work every day inside Greentown Labs versus maybe a larger environment. So there's lots of benefits, I think, to that deep immersion. So I think it's maybe an alternative to setting up your own lab. You can also be part of a lab that we've kind of figured out how to do it and uh, how to attract the startups and be in a good place with them. So we're always happy to have partners that want to be part of that. Yeah. I'm guessing that, that Batman mentioned it too, but you know that intra entrepreneurship where ideas that are inside your company being able to be accommodated in a way that's quite interesting is another really interesting way to get things started. You know where you have teams and interesting projects that could be done in a different way. But it uh, sounds like yours may have come from uh, an idea-thon, it sounds like. It, yeah. uh, agency grew out of an idea-thon yeah. uh, with my Captains of Innovation hat on. So we work with corporate clients. And so I will say I could talk at length about this. We actually help corporate set up innovation labs. And I think just a few key points for you, Jim, is to have a space that's separate away from headquarters. You absolutely need... Um, top CEO leadership support, you need entrepreneurial leadership support, but you need a safe area to experiment. So you need it away from the headquarters. No um, and uh, you also need to be in touch with the business units because time and time again, if uh, the idea people are coming up with new blue sky ideas and it doesn't relate to the KPIs that the business units have, uh, you can't just hand the ideas over. So they'll die on the vine. So, um, no question. so, uh, so it was about five years ago that um, the uh, McKinsey philosophy of the three horizons of growth started to resonate in ADI. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with this, it, it ended up in a, a book called The Alchemy of Growth that was quite popular. Um, and basically that philosophy says that any entity, certainly any technology company, but really any entity can uh, divide its business and its focus and its strategic intent into, into three horizons. And Horizon one being your current business and defending and protecting and enlarging that business. Horizon two is your current growth businesses and uh, the investment that you make, usually in adjacent capabilities to be able to add on to your business. And then horizon three is experimenting and looking for the seeds of future growth, which is generally reaching beyond adjacent spaces and looking for new capabilities. And so we thought this was a really good philosophy and we I was running one of the business units at the time. And as a company, we said, okay, look, what we're going to do now is be very strict about this and we're going to assess how much of our 
investments fall into each of these horizons and see whether we kind of follow this model. And, you know, we promptly did that. And our horizon one investment was quite significant. And our horizon two investment was quite reasonable. And our horizon three investment was pitiful. And um, so we were looking at that and kind of saying, well, why is that? And, you know, when you have business units that are gold on getting a return within five years, mm -hmm. they adjust their risk uh, tolerance appropriately. And so if you have a scaled down risk tolerance and you meet a startup that has some very convincing and, and, and interesting technology, but they can answer your questions about, well, is it reliable, repeatable? You know, am I going to be able to manufacture that? And, you know, the startup is generally there made up of PhDs that have spent seven years developing this technology. They're like, we don't know. <laughs> well, at that point, our BUs would walk out the door, you know, and they go back to doing what they do. And, and so we, we realized that there was an impedance mismatch there. So back to the impedance uh, yeah. issue again. And, and so what the garage was then created or, or we felt the need to create an entity that had greater risk tolerance maybe a greater ability to understand the reality of the startup world and the research world and know that certain areas can be very thoroughly covered. And these people are experts in their areas, but they're not experts in figuring out, will this be something that's suitable for high volume manufacturing or can we get the cost down on this? And they just don't know that. And so that's what we spend a lot of time doing is discovering these sorts of technologies and trying to help uncover the surprises and that's what the analog garage does oh and there's one one other spin on this is that uh we had acquired a company which um was called lyric labs and it was based in cic and uh it was made up of fas a fascinating group of engineers and we kind of acquired it because of the people which mm -hmm. um, as emily mentioned earlier you generally do um but then it hadn't gelled within the company. So this, these great set of capabilities just hadn't worked. And, you know, it was a little bit of the, the antibody effect where the technologists in the company were not really accepting these new skill sets that were in this startup. And the startup was deciding that the rest of the company were idiots. And <laughs> the, <laughs> so that wasn't working out. So what we did was we cross-pollinated some people and, and made those connections happen. And we use that as the nucleus of the garage, which took on this larger strategy of, of working with external companies, doing it internally. And yes. that's kind of what the layers have been built around that. that sounds fantastic. Let no crisis go it's on. It's a story. Um, but we have, I know we're most importantly going to want to spend time together as a more of a mingling kind of thing. But let's have one more question if we might. Sure. We'll see if whether um, everyone needs to answer it, but we'll see how it goes. In your so, name, please. I Imran Said. I'm uh, part of the entrepreneurship and innovation faculty at uh, MIT Sloan. And my question is for the uh, folks from the big corporate, um, you know, so j, j Thomson Reuters, Analog. How do you um, prevent your innovation lab from sort of just being a marketing showcase, right? Where, you know, clients are brought in, it looks nice, it's pretty, you've got the latest technologies, um, but really no innovation is happening, right? Um, how do you sort of prevent that? Who goes first? OK, I can take that. So, uh, <laughs> so basically, the, the customers who come through here, uh, and there are increasing numbers of customers coming through here, are always very enamored of what we're doing here. They, they, they love the space. And they see the technology that we're working on. And you know they're dazzled. But for the most part, we're working on technologies that are pre-product. And so there is no engagement point. Those guys do not pay the bills. Uh, the bills are paid by graduating the technologies that we're working on and getting them into our business units and scaling up those investments and showing proof of that. And within ADI, which is a very metric-driven culture, we have to continually, in other words, I have to continually show that we're, that we're generating technology that is worthwhile. And I can't just say it's worthwhile. Our cus internal customers, our BUs, have to confirm that, oh yeah, this technology that we got from the garage and that we're working on with them to productize, that's going to be worth this much. And so you know, the analog garage has already generated over a billion dollars in technology. The value of technology is kind of a little bit uh, fluffy, but um, uh, our, our BUs 
are the ones making those estimates and assessing the value of the product from here. So customers come in and very often their inputs are tremendously valuable, but it's not a showcase and it's not a sales tool. And that's, uh, we, we resist those visits uh, very much. That's not what we're about here. Let me get the microphone for you, Brian. So, you know, we do the occasional, we have people in occasionally, not all that often. Um, and we are, you know, building things that are um, headed towards product, but we are an early stage proof of concept shop largely. But the, uh, yeah, I would say that the value of what we're doing is not just in the eventual sales of what we are delivering, but there's a tremendous value to the company, to be honest, in uh, just showing our customers that we're thinking innovatively and that we're, um, you know, uh, sponsoring these kinds of activities. People tended to think of, of Thomson Reuters um, as just a sort of information utility. You know, you turned on the spigot and you got some information and you turned it off and that was it. That there was no sort of uh, innovation around analytics and machine learning and, and all of that. And so the customers are super happy to learn that we're not just... Um, you know, taking content and, and delivering it and aggregating it, but that we're providing uh, more and more insight to them. So um, there's tremendous value to the to the company in that. On the case of j and I would say, you know, what we did, you know, and I mentioned five years earlier, we said at the very beginning, it's going to take some time, right? We're going to build a portfolio. And although many things we did, you know, didn't involve our corporate venture arm, we thought that everything we did was on the sort of the rubric of being an investor. So we were really focused on what kind of return, what kind of risk we did uh, mitigate, what kind of calculations could we do on the amount of money that was being invested alongside this. But I think perhaps the biggest thing that we you know, uh, guessed and got right goes back to something that Kerry had said earlier. Uh, we had deep uh, embedded relationships with the operating companies that we were really serving on behalf of, and we would not invest unless they would invest alongside us. So everything that we did had internal alignment from the very beginning. Now, we would invest in things that were far more forward-thinking or futuristic or crazy, things that we'd never do internally, you know, and they would only have to invest, you know, a dollar next to, say, mine, and those two dollars would go get eight dollars of other people's money and projects would be underway, and all those projects were done on the outside, and we would only really, you know, truly bring them inside once, you know, major uh, events took place, scientific events that you know allowed us to believe that it was really moving forward. Now we should take more responsibility for it, but it takes time. I think that's the most important thing to tell anyone, that, you know, in any of the spaces, healthcare in particular. You know, you're not going to create what you consider to be a defendable argument with the CFO or the board, you know, in a couple of years of doing this. So, with that said, I'm going to get the hook. I'm sure we're a little over, but. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. We certainly enjoyed spending time with you. We have time left with the panelists to ask them all the things we didn't touch on. Again, thank you again for spending some time. Thanks to the organizers. Thank you.